Hey there, welcome back. I am going to be starting in on paragraph 28 of the Advent of Divine Justice. And I've mentioned before that this wonderful copy, the paragraphs are numbered and um, the headings for each section has been removed to the in, has been moved to the index. So I just wanted to share that the section we are starting in on, I don't know if this was um, officially part of Shogi Fini's letter. I don't think it was. I think it was created for organizational purposes of the letter, but it's interesting. The section we are moving from was called Overview of the North American Baha'i Community its success, responsibilities, and glorious future. And now the section we are starting in on with paragraph 28 is call for the acquisition of virtues needed to equip the North American Baha'is to fulfill their destiny. Call for the acquisition of virtues needed. So here we go. Paragraph 28. Dearly beloved friends, great is my love and admiration for you. Convinced as I am of the paramount share which you can and will undoubtedly have in both the continental and international spheres of, spheres of future Baha'i activity and service. I feel it nevertheless incumbent upon me to utter at this junction a word of warning. The glowing tribute so repeatedly and deservedly paid to the capacity, the spirit, the conduct, and the high rank of the American believers, both individually and as an organic community, must under no circumstances be confounded with the characteristics and nature of the people from which God has raised them up. A sharp distinction between that community and that people must be made and resolutely and fearlessly upheld if we wish to give due recognition to the transmuting power of the faith of Baha'u'llah in its impact on the lives and standards of those who have chosen to enlist under his banner. Otherwise, the supreme and distinguishing function of his revelation, which is none other than the calling into being of a new race of men, will remain wholly unrecognized and completely obscured. How often have the prophets of God, not accepting Baha'u'llah himself, chosen to appear and deliver their message in countries and amidst peoples and races at a time when they were either fast declining or had already touched the lowest depths of moral and spiritual degradation. The appalling misery and wretchedness to which the Israelites had sunk under the debasing and tyrannical rule of the pharaohs in the days preceding their exodus from Egypt under the leadership of Moses, the decline that had set in the religious, the spiritual, the cultural, and moral life of the Jewish people at the time of the appearance of Jesus Christ, the barbarous cruelty, the gross idolatry and immorality which had for so long been the most distressing features of the tribes of Arabia and brought such shame upon them when Muhammad arose to proclaim his message in their midst. The indescribable state of decadence with its attendant corruption, confusion, intolerance, and oppression in both the civil and religious life of Persia so graphically portrayed by the pen of a considerable number of scholars, diplomats, and travelers at the hour of the revelation of Baha'u'llah, all demonstrate this basic and inescapable fact. To contend that the innate worthiness, the high moral standard, the political aptitude, 
and social attainments of any race or nation is the reason for the appearance in its midst of any of these divine luminaries would be an absolute perversion of historical facts and would amount to a complete repudiation of the undoubted interpretation placed upon them. So clearly and emphatically by both Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Baha. How great then must be the challenge to those who, belonging to such races and nations, have responded to the call which these prophets have raised, so unreservedly recognize and courageously testify to this indubitable truth, that not by reason of any racial superiority, political capacity, or spiritual virtue which a race or nation might possess, but rather as a direct consequence of its crying needs, its lamentable degeneracy and irremediable perversity. Has the prophet of God chosen to appear in its midst and with it as a leper has lifted the entire human race to a higher and nobler plane of life and conduct? For it is precisely under such circumstances and by such means that the prophets have from time immemorial chosen and were able to demonstrate their redemptive power to raise from the depths of abasement and misery the people of their own race and nation, empowering them to, empowering them to transmit in turn to other races and nations, the saving grace and the energizing influence of their revelation. In the light of this fundamental principle, it should always be borne in mind, nor can it be sufficiently emphasized that the primary reason why the Bab and Baha'u'llah chose to appear in Persia and to make it the first repository of their revelation was because of all the peoples and nations of the civilized world, that race and nation had, as so often depicted by Abdu'l-Bahá, sunk to such ig ignominious depths and manifested so great a perversity as to find no parallel among its contemporaries. For no more convincing proof could be adduced demonstrating the regenerating spirit animating the revelations proclaimed by the Bab and Baha'u'llah than their power to transform what can truly be, be regarded as one of the most backward, the most cowardly, and perverse of peoples into a race of heroes fit to effect in turn a similar revolution in the life of mankind, to have appeared among a race or nation which by its intrinsic worth and high attainment seemed to warrant the inestimable privilege of being made the receptacle of such a revelation would in the eyes of an unbelieving world greatly reduce the efficacy of that message and detract from the self-sufficiency of its omnipotent power. The contrast so strikingly presented in the pages of Nabil's narrative between the heroism that immortalized the life and deeds of the dawnbreakers and the de degeneracy and cowardice of their defamers and persecutors is in itself a most impressive testimony to the truth of the message of him who had instilled such a spirit into the breasts of his disciples. For any believer of that race to maintain that the excellence of his country and the innate nobility of its people were fundamental reasons for its being singled out as the primary receptacle of, revelation, of the revelation of the Bab and Baha'u'llah, would be unutterable, nope, untenable in the face of the overwhelming evidence afforded so convincingly by that narrative. 
To a lesser degree, this principle must of necessity apply to the country which has vindicated its right to be regarded as the cradle of the world order of Baha'u'llah. So great a function, so noble a role, can be regarded as no less inferior to the part played by those immortal souls who, through their sublime renunciation and unparalleled deeds, have been responsible for the birth of the faith itself. Let not, therefore, those who are to participate so predominantly in the birth of that world civilization, which is the direct offspring of their faith, imagine for a moment that for some mysterious purpose or by any reason of inherent excellence or special merit, Baha'u'llah has chosen to confer upon their country and people so great and lasting a distinction. It is precisely by it is precisely by reason of the patent evils which notwithstanding its other admittedly great characteristics and achievements an excessive and binding materialism has unfortunately engendered within it that the author of their faith and the center of his covenant have singled it out to become the standard bearer of the new world order envisaged in their writings. It is by such means as this that Baha'u'llah can best demonstrate to a heedless generation his almighty power to raise up from the very midst of a people immersed in a sea of materialism, a prey to one of the most very virulent and long-standing forms of racial prejudice and notorious for its political corruption, lawlessness, and laxity in moral standards. Men and women who, as time goes by, will increasingly exemplify those essential virtues of self-renunciation, of moral rectitude, of chastity, of indiscriminating fellowship, of holy discipline, and of spiritual insight that will fit them for the preponderating share they will have in calling into being that world order and that world civilization of which their country no less than the entire human race, stands in desperate need. Theirs will be the duty and privilege in their capacity, first as establishers of one of the most powerful pillars sustaining the edifice of the Universal House of Justice, and then as the champion builders of that new world order of which that house is to be the nucleus and forerunner, to inculcate, demonstrate, and apply those twin and sorely needed principles of divine justice and order, principles to which the political corruption and the moral license increasingly staining the society to which they belong offer so sad and striking a contrast. This reminds me of what Dr. Suhail Bashrui explained to me one time that um, that Persia was spiritually corrupt and hence a receptacle of this glorious revelation and that America is um, materially corrupt and hence we are the builders um, of this, this beautiful new civilization. So that concludes paragraph 31, and I will stop there for today. Have a great one, and I hope you are inspired.